Somewhere between the bottom of the climb and the summit is the answer to the mystery why we climb. Mountains. Well, it's once again time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. I woke to the sound of my alarm blaring like an annoying siren. I slapped the snooze button to shut it up. I'd always slept in since being made redundant from my job a few years ago, which eventually resulted in my losing my house and my marriage. The sky was still dark blue outside from what I could tell by the small gap in my curtain, so it didn't hurt to get a few more hours of shut eye. As I tried to drift off to sleep again, the buzzing of my phone forced my eyes wide open. I let out a groan of discomfort as I slid my hand under the pillow to grab it. I wondered who could be calling me at this time since no one, well, no one really did anymore. Jenny's name popped up on the caller ID. Why would she be calling me at this time? She had never once called me since we'd signed the papers to call it quits on our marriage. Hello? I called out, holding the cool metal surface to my ear. It's me. Jenny, she answered in a somber tone. Brian, it's Ellie. She's gone missing. What? I sat up, fully awake now. Oh, how? A few days ago, she went hiking with her friends and never returned, she whimpered. What? You never thought about telling me this sooner? What if you called the police? I questioned her. It was as if she didn't even care enough to tell me all this had happened. Yes, they've been searching everywhere. They asked me to call anyone who might have taken her if she'd run away from home. I've not seen her. You should have told me this earlier. Did she say where she was going? I wanted to tell you this, but I know how much you really hated that place. They went hiking in the woods near your father's old house. As soon as she mentioned that house, my heart sank like a rock in the ocean. The hairs on my neck became erect, and a cold shiver trembled throughout my body. Oh, fuck. I finished before slamming down the phone. Harrison Manor, my family's ancestral home since the founding of the gold mine on Dark Mountain. From what little I could remember, my grandfather Jeremy had passed it down to my father Thomas as he passed away. I fucking hated the place. Oh, the creaky doors, rumbling floorboards, and that weird aura surrounding the place. It just stank of death. My mother had died in that damn place. For what few accounts I could find, she had apparently fallen off the bedroom balcony straight onto the hard concrete floor underneath. Tragic accident, they call it. But I knew exactly what went on there. The footsteps you'd hear at night, pacing through the hallways and the Creepy whispering from the corner of the room. Oh, that place sent shivers down my spine. Took my mother's death at the hands of that cursed house for my father to realise we needed to hightail it out of there. I vividly remember my father trying to shove me awake. Brian, Brian, get up now. We need to get out of here. My father shouted whilst continually yanking me backwards and forwards. A strange woman's voice maliciously laughed in the hallway, jolting me awake as soon as I realised it was my mother's voice. But how could that be? I asked myself. We'd just buried her two months earlier. Well, the next thing I remembered was my father's tight grip around my petite arms before he tossed me onto his shoulder, covering my face with a towel before sprinting faster than an athlete down the curved wooden stairs to the ground floor. As he made his way down... The bedsheet had fallen just seconds before he got through the front door of the house. Enough time to see the silhouette of a woman. I still have nightmares to this day about them gleaming crimson eyes that peered deep into my soul. All these years I've kept my distance from that damned atrocity of a house. But now the time had come for me to face my fears. I had no choice but to go back there. My daughter's life depended on it. I picked my phone up and scrolled through my list of contacts. I pressed the screen on my father's number and called him. The call went straight to the payment service. I had missed my payment. Oh. 
I hung up the phone before jumping out of bed and made my way to the restroom. I rushed to get changed into warm clothing. The mountain had always been a cold and damp place, regardless of the season. I left the apartment on an empty stomach, ignoring the piles of final notice letters, and unlocked my old beater of a car before twisting the key to start her up. The fuel light lit up and flashed. After topping up her tank with the last ten dollars I had left in my wallet, I set off towards my ancestral home. The tip of the mountain peaked above the heads of the nearby trees, getting bigger as I neared the demented clutches of its grass. I arrived at the dilapidated dirt path that led towards the old town. It had been abandoned for more than half a century since the eventual demise of that cursed mine. My feet dug through the layers of decomposed leaves which had almost turned to soil. It had once been neatly kept by Mr. Wilson, the caretaker. I remember my father had once told me the story of how he lost his eye in a mining accident. The pickaxe had slipped out of his hand and ended up bouncing off the wall so hard it landed in his eye socket, leaving him blinded for the remainder of his life. I had only seen him a couple of times as a child. His tall, slender body, wrinkly skin, and that intimidating leather eye patch he always wore. My grandfather Thomas felt sorry for the man and gave him the job of taking care of the manor. When the other miners abandoned the village after the mine ran dry of precious ore, he stayed behind and worked without pay, owing him a lifetime of servitude. The unnatural fog that had always surrounded this damn mountain began to surround me as I neared the heart of the lonely village. It became so dense I couldn't see further than a few meters in front of me. Ellie, I called out at the top of my voice, only to hear the echo bounce back. Ellie, I shouted once more. There was still no response. I turned to shout once more when I noticed a small silhouette of a child. I ran towards it, but it disappeared before I could catch it. Hello, I called out. You can come out. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm just looking for my daughter, Ellie. Hello? God damn it. I noticed a small pathway in the ground. I followed it until I reached a set of old, rusty gates which led me into the graveyard next to the old church. The graves of my ancestors and deceased townsfolk were scattered around me. I reached the thick wooden doors of the monastery which had been left open. Once abandoned, the town had been subjected to the occasional looting by lowlifes, Nature had crawled inside through all the nooks and crannies to reclaim the land which it had once ruled. Nothing but a cold darkness blanketed the once warm interior of the chapel. I grabbed my lighter and lit one of the old lanterns and checked to see if it would still ignite. Luckily, there were enough fumes in the relic to give me a viable light source. In the corner of the nave, a child's figure hid behind the altar. Hello? I called out. The child peeked from the sides, watching me as I approached. It's all right. I won't hurt you, I softly said in the nicest tone I could muster. What's your name? The child moved away from the altar until there was nothing light for me to see. It was a young boy, younger than ten years of age by the looks of him. Oh, I thought you was a one-eyed man, he whimpered. He couldn't have meant the caretaker, but it must have been decades since his death. He was a wrinkly old man when I was a little boy in the 1960s. No, why would you say that? He's been dead for years. Come here, young man. The boy moved closer. Once in the light of the lantern, I noticed his cold blue skin. What are you doing here? Where are your parents? I asked determined to know what this little boy was doing out here in the middle of nowhere. My name's Timothy, he said, looking down before I noticed a tear roll down his cheek. My mother was killed by the one-eyed man. He's been trying to get me ever since. Everyone knew the mines had been abandoned due to the fact that they'd been run dry, and not a soul had called this town their home in over forty years. Hmm. Something was off about this whole situation. Look, you kept mentioning this one-eyed man. I've told you, he's been dead for many years now. There's no way he could still be alive after all these years. You're wrong. 
I saw him the other day. He was carrying a girl on his shoulder back to Lord Harrison's house. What? Did you see what the little girl looked like? Well, my daughter went missing around here a few days ago. What did the girl look like? I asked, dropping down to my knees to grab the boy's arms. A cold, dreadful feeling erupted in my hands as a cold energy froze the tips of my fingers to a point where I thought they'd fall off. I winched them back before I noticed the boy had vanished. I looked around to try and find him, but to no avail. Hello? I called out. Hey, where have you gone? The words echoed a few times until nothing but a deafening silence filled my ears. What on earth just happened? The path led me back to town where I followed the old cobblestone road to the great wooden doors of my ancestral home. I pushed to open them, but they were welded shut, and without the key I needed to find another way in. But luckily, the time I'd spent here as a child did not go without adventure. The nostalgic rush of running around in the garden brought a tear to my eye. I had run into the shed whilst my father was building a new fence for Mother's flower garden, and he'd needed to go into the basement to gather some, well, to get some tools, hiding the spare basement key behind a pile of old cobblestone which had gathered nearly a century of dust. I pulled the stones apart, causing some to hit the mouldy floor, and then a dark metallic texture dotted with spots of rust greeted my eyes. Oh, hopefully this works. Whilst in the shed I found a small container of kerosene, I filled the lantern I'd found earlier and made my way to the rotten doors of the basement. The doors opened their arms, creaking and crashing to the ground as I let go of their grasp. The thick fog flowed into its dark depths as I ignited my lantern and stomped down the sandstone stairs. I'd never been in the basement. My father had always told me to wait in the garden whenever he'd gone inside. Ah, there's decades of dust and mould down there, oh, and spiders as big as your hands. His voice echoed in my mind. I'd hated spiders with a passion as a kid, and this house was always so full of them. Crawling up the walls, hanging from the ceiling and leaving cobwebs as big as a person in their wake. The basement was full to brim with their dead carcasses, along with webs that were so old that they were covered in thick dust like every other square inch of this damn place. The dull light of the lamp illuminated the area enough so that I could see rows of junk and cardboard boxes full of old family heirlooms. An old bookcase heirlooms. full of leather journals caught my attention, near the stairs leading up to the ground floor. I randomly selected one of the books and wiped the dust off with my hand. It was an aged journal belonging to the man that had built this house, Jonathan Harrison, the man who discovered gold in the mountain and founded my family's reputation. I stuffed it into my jacket pocket to read once I'd found better lighting conditions. I stomped up the stairs leading up and kicked the door wide open, snapping the rusted iron lock in half. Early, I called out. Now, the only replies I could hear were the echoes of my voice bouncing off the damp surface of the crumbling walls. I pushed the lantern ahead and marched into the main hall before looking up the stairs where they became engulfed in darkness. A set of heavy footsteps erupted above my head. I ran up as fast as I could, nearly stumbling over in the process, frantically calling Ellie's name. Most of the doors in the hallway were closed, shut, except the door to my old bedroom. My father must have left it open when we escaped all those years ago. It was open enough to allow a little bit of light to pour through the edges, somewhat lighting my path. I took in a deep breath and swung it open. It had been left untouched, exactly how I remembered it the night my father had taken me away. A small bed stood in front of the large, single glazed window where the curtains were left half open. I pulled them apart to allow more light to flow in. My toys littered the floor, as they always did. A light mist grew in my eyes as my mother's image burned in the dark corners of my mind. Years of torment, drug use and counselling had caused me to forget her face. But her love for me and the things she did for me had never ceased to exist. Oh, she would always tell me off for leaving such a mess in my room and clean it up every day just for me to do the same thing the following day. 
I sighed before grabbing the journal from the depths of my pocket, before setting my eyes on the ancient paper. The ink had faded to the point where some of the words had become incomprehensible, and brown stains that looked like tea had scarred the paper. Jonathan Harrison, my ancestor, had travelled west with his fellow soldiers after their victory in the Mexican-American War. The US government had given them mineral rights to the Colorado mountain range for their efforts in the war. With the Californian gold rush in full effect, they set out with their pickaxes, weapons and supplies to scour the lands for gold. As a captain in the military, Jonathan had naturally been given command of the band of prospectors. After nearly a year of no success, they stumbled upon a tribe on a mountain known by the natives as Dark Mountain, the Chechne, the people of the rocks. According to these people, it was their mission to guard the spirits that roam the caverns of the mountain. Occasionally, they traded with the Spanish for over a hundred years in furs, food and weapons. While some of the restless prospectors, fueled by a never-ending greed, had noticed some of the natives wearing golden trinkets and began harassing them to trade and allow them to mine the mountain. Outraged by this, the elder asked them to all leave their lands. Angered by this, some of the men aimed their revolvers at the natives, which led to a large confrontation. Before the situation could be contained, bullets and arrows flew across both sides, injuring and killing many, their blood seeping through the pores of the dirt and into the belly of the mountain. Only Jonathan and a handful of his men survived the ordeal. They stared at the chief, who coughed a lungful of blood, before laughing and speaking words in his native tongue. I stopped reading the journal, disgusted at the horrible events depicted in it. My family's legacy was based on the bloodshed of the natives at the hands of stupid greed. No wonder karma had come back to bite the family in the ass. No wonder I'd never had any luck with money, or with anyone, to be fair. I'd met my wife Jenny while studying at college, and before we knew it, we were both falling in the deep clutches of each other's hearts. Before we knew it, we were married with a child on the way. I was working in a local part-time job at an accounting firm when depression struck me harder than lightning. I lost my job, my wife, and my life. I gasped a deep breath before letting loose a deep sigh. The sound of heavy footsteps echoed down the hallway before a door creaked open and then shortly slammed shut. I stumbled out of the bedroom and darted down the hallway, opening doors and searching all the rooms one by one. They were all void of anyone or anything. Oh, who could that have beaten? I even checked the closets. Hey, is anyone there? I know you're here somewhere. I just heard you run down the hall. I called out in a raised tone. What the hell was up with this place? There was no sign of anyone. Well, the evening began to set in with the light dimming of the sky. I didn't feel like staying here any longer, so I made my way back down into the basement. As I neared the entrance, I noticed it was now shut. I'd never closed it. I pushed with all my strength, but couldn't get it to budge even an inch. It was as if something heavy had been placed over it. I sighed and made my way back into the main hall. I remember my father had always kept a spare key for the main door in his office, which was just down the hall. I swung the door open, which revealed many bookcases filled with a century's worth of reading material. Piles of paperwork sat on his desk in the far corner of the room. While I was prowling through the small cabinet, I noticed a dark iron key with a keychain which held another key which read, Mines. I don't know why the key for the mine was attached to the house key, and I didn't really care as long as I could open the front door and get out. The last thing I wanted was to sleep the night here. As I went for the door, a loud scream emerged from outside. I darted for the entrance and twisted the key with all my strength. The lock had nearly completely seized, but I managed to prop it open, slamming the door on the wooden frame that surrounded it. I ran outside, but the darkness of the evening made it harder to see anything in the dense fog which had become even thicker. Another scream erupted. I turned towards the path which led me to the old mines where a large
large, shadowy figure held what looked like a woman before the fog obscured my vision again. I ran along the old cobbled path towards the mine. The figure had disappeared as if it was just my mind playing tricks on me. The blanket of evening loomed as I sighed at the disappearance of the man before approaching the entrance of the mine. The entrance had been left wide open to greet me with its open arms, as if someone had rushed into the mine not to even bother closing the doors behind them. Well, whoever that was must have gone in there. Before entering, I lit the lantern that I'd found in the church. I could see just enough so I didn't stumble over my own footing as I edged closer to the heart of the tomb, which had once held a great many riches for those who came before me. The sound of water drops echoed down the surface of the old, damp walls as I reached the ancient wooden elevator that led deeper into the bowels of this cursed mountain. It had been lowered all the way down. There was a door near it which read, Office. I tried to open it, twisting the handle a few times, but to no result. I took the key which I'd found earlier in my father's office, and lined it up against the wall. Well, it was a perfect fit. Once the room was illuminated with the dim yellow flame of the lantern, I noticed another desk where piles of rotten paperwork, a ledger, and a small journal rested neatly upon its surface. A silver-plated pickaxe rested in place on a plaque behind the desk. I picked the journal up, reading the name on the front. It belonged to an Oliver Harrison. If my memory served me right, that was the name of my great-grandfather. Curious to know more, I opened it and read. He had taken over the mine after his father had mysteriously died whilst conducting a survey of the lower levels. He would spent many days lamenting over the demise of his father before taking the mantle of running the mine himself. This was around the time when the output of the mine had begun to deteriorate, to the point where many miners had left of their own accord to find a better work elsewhere. He had received reports that described strange noises and shadowy figures roaming the deep caverns below. Annoyed by these reports, he ventured down, only to return a few days later with no recollection of what had transpired. And he only brought one thing out with him, and that was a large nugget of silver, which had been scraped against a rock to hold a sharp edge. After this point, the words in the journal became unintelligible. From what I could discern from the journal, my great-grandfather had created a weapon from silver, and he must have discovered a weakness to the evil that lurked deep within. I turned around and grabbed the silver-plated pickaxe, which held the initials OH-999AG, engraved upon the wooden handle. He must have made this to fight the shadow people. If there was any chance of me getting out of this alive, it would be with this pickaxe. With the generator out of order and no fuel to even get it started, there'd be no way I could pull the elevator back up. Well, I doubted it would even hold my weight, without snapping after all these years. Opposite the office door, I noticed a path that the miners would have used before its installation. At the bottom, I found the remains of the lift, Broken pieces and shards of wood littered the floor like a shattered pane of glass. Large amounts of water seeping into the mine had caused it to flood the lower levels, and red rusty water reached all the way up to my ankles. My socks were soaked, and my feet were saturated to the bone as I kicked my way through this grimy water. I froze like a statue as I heard the splashing of footsteps in the distance. I aimed the light of the lantern ahead only for the hairs on the back of my neck to become erect, and a strange feeling of uneasiness to tingle throughout my body. The shadowy figure of a man stopped in its tracks and turned to face me. Oh, what in the hell is this? Upon examining me for a moment, it lunged towards me with that opaque, dark body of its. I managed to raise the pickaxe in front of me, just in time to stop it in its tracks. It just stared at me, with its featureless face obviously frightened to go anywhere near the silver. Well, I wasn't going to wait any longer just staring at it. I raised the pickaxe once more, and with all my might I pushed the sharp end of it towards the face of this angry spirit. Its body dissipated into the surrounding air. 
Feeling a lot safer now that it had been dealt with, I continued to move forward. Up ahead, I noticed movement, so I slowed down and hid behind a mining crate. From what I could tell, it was the man from before who was carrying the body of that woman. It was too foggy for me to notice if it was Ellie or not, but regardless of finding my daughter, there was someone who needed my help. The figure stopped what it was doing before turning around to stare in my general vicinity. Oh, it must have sensed me somehow. I removed myself from cover to confront this maniac. Once in the light of the lantern, I noticed the black eye patch around its eye. It was the caretaker, but his dark blue skin and gleaming yellow eye made me rethink this whole situation. The caretaker had been dead for decades. There was absolutely no way he could have survived that long here, all alone. It could be an evil spirit that's taken control of his deceased body. The caretaker raised his pickaxe and let out a deep, demented growl, almost making me wet my pants as I readied my silver weapon to defend myself. Then the caretaker charged towards me with a relentless blow. I managed to dodge to the side and avoid his attack. Splashes of water dispersed in every direction, some even landing on my face. Adrenaline raced through my body like a powerful bolt of lightning. I nearly dropped my only source of light in the process. I held on to its rusted handle tightly as its rough surface pricked my hand like a cactus. The enraged warden lost his balance as the sharp claw of his weapon splashed in the water, most likely ripping a chunk of the floor apart. He swiftly turned, and like a raged bull, came at me once again, but I managed to dodge in the nick of time as he charged into the uneven spine of the tunnel. Taking my opportunity, I whacked him in the head, lodging the silver-plated pickaxe deep into the mess of brains that remained. The shock of the blow still reverberated throughout my arm. It would have rendered any normal person obsolete, but this creature just shrugged it off. I just stood there, frozen like a statue. Before I could even react, the creature had barged into me with its shoulder, knocking me down into the murky water, ass first. My clothes became saturated, and the final embers of the lantern breathed their last breath before dying out. Oh, damn it, I shouted. I was now truly fucked. The caretaker's feet splashed in the water as he made his way towards me in the pitch-black tunnel. I tried to stay as still as possible, even going as far as holding my breath just to survive a little bit longer. But it was no use. The bastard just kept coming on towards me. I closed my eyes as the failures of my life flashed before them. Oh, I wasn't proud of some of the decisions I'd made in life, but I would never trade it if it meant saving my daughter from the clutches of this tyrannical place. Clenched the wooden handle of my weapon with a vice-like grip, seconds before my demise. Suddenly the creature stopped in its tracks as the sounds of Native American war cries erupted like a swarm of bats all around me. I opened my eyes to the sight of total shock. The hairs on the back of my neck became elongated and a terror gushed into my body, as the gleaming bodies of spectral figures swung their weapons at the caretaker. What remained of his lifeless body lay almost fully submerged face down in the water. There was enough light from the ghostly figures to illuminate the dark body of the cave. They all stood around me in a circle before one stepped forward. You are not Oliver Harrison. Why do you wield his weapon? I peered into its translucent eyes, with fear coursing through my veins. Could this be real? Or did that abomination kill me, and this is the afterlife? I gasped in a breath and sighed. My name is Brian Harrison. Oliver was my great-grandfather. This thing, I pointed at the dead body, it took my daughter. I don't know where she is. Can you please help me? I cried, dropping a few tears in with my plea. The figure turned and looked deeper into the cave. I am afraid you're too late. 
He must have taken her here to the other side. The other side? I asked. Beyond the water lies a gate. Once past, it will take you to the lair of the demon that chokes us all with a curse. So, you're also afflicted with the same curse as my damn family. I sighed. My people, the Sekhain, died protecting this mountain from the greed of your family. The silver ore that once filled this mountain protected us all from the whims of the Nun Tunewi. Oliver understood this and tried to stop the mining operation, but it was too late. Its reach is now greater than the mountain itself, the spectre explained. Now I understood why he kept this silver pickaxe in the office. For someone like me to figure this all out. But if anyone's going to defeat this demon, it has to be me. How do I lift the curse and get my daughter back? I'll do anything just to hold her in my arms again, even if it's the death of me. The curse can't be lifted. The demon is too powerful for even us. You don't even stand a chance. I had believed Oliver to be the person to lift the curse, but even he failed. When he returned from the battle, there was a part of his soul missing. Only with the death of the demon, who is now many times more powerful than it was then, will the curse be lifted. He looked at his warriors and continued. Your cause is just. We will not stop you. We will journey with you through the gate. The demon's magic is too powerful for us to take this form. Then, how will you accompany me there? That ghostly aura dissipated into the air around me, gushing into the core of my weapon like water being funneled down a drain. Their presence illuminated the silver with enough light radiating from it to illuminate my dark path. The water began to rise and reached almost to my neck, but the spirit kept guiding me further. I had become completely submerged in the water and just about could make my way along. Panic began to set in as the deep breath I took earlier began to run out. My brain was becoming hungry for oxygen as starvation began to take hold. My eyesight began to fade and that was when I knew I'd just made the worst mistake of my life. Mere seconds before I'd passed out, My head peaked above the water and I grasped the most desperate breath of air I had ever taken in my life. My sight slowly returned to me and that was when I noticed the gleaming crimson surface of the cave as if it had been covered in large rubies. An unnatural heat hugged me as I walked further and the water went back down again. I used the glow of the pickaxe to ignite my path as I navigated the endless cavern. A vast chamber presented itself to me where rows of torches lit the demon's lair. The blood-filled ruby sparkled in the flickering of the flames, surrounded by the giant claws which held the remains of the creature's victims. I noticed the tormented expressions on their blackened faces as I tried to imagine the suffering they must have gone through. Across from me in the far end, one of the bodies stood out from the others. It was that of a young girl. I ran towards her as fast as I could. Ellie, I shouted to no response. There was enough space between the fingers of the unnatural hand that held her for me to check her pulse. She was still alive. I furiously shook her with all I had in an attempt to wake her. Ellie's eyes snapped open. She began to scream as if she'd just awoken from a nightmare. If only she realized that it was me who'd come to save her. Ellie, it's me. Calm down before it realizes. I'm here. I tried to persuade her to no avail. She just carried on in a frenzy. All my efforts to calm her down were futile, as I slowly realized she was stuck in some kind of trance that the demon had put her in. A deep menacing growl erupted in the distance when the large figure of the creature unveiled itself from the corner of my eye. I turned to face its gigantic body, a hulk of green scaly meat over eight feet tall and as broad as three men. Two horns protruded from its head and curved around like they did on a goat's head. 
He growled once again at the sight of me, revealing razor-sharp teeth that could have ripped me in half given the chance. It moved fast considering its size, and nearly caught me off guard as I dodged its charge. God, what have I got myself into here? One measly hit from this thing would almost definitely mean the end of me. I did the only thing I could, and that was to run to the other end of the chamber from where I'd come. I raised the pickaxe and whispered into it. How the fuck am I going to even kill that thing? Hoping that the Native American warriors that had hitchhiked with me to this dark and forsaken place could lend me some of their valuable knowledge in my time of need. The non Tunui's source of power comes from the victims it has tortured. The people whose souls are trapped in the hellish hands of this creature's grasp must be released from their torment. Only then may you face it on equal terms. Moments before the creature closed in on me, the thought clicked in my head. I jogged to the nearest body and swung the axe into its head. A gassy white aura emerged from the body before I moved on to the next one. Before long, I had managed to outrun the demon and release half a dozen souls from their misery. But my success had come to an end when it had finally caught me by surprise with a powerful thump. I was launched to the other side of the chamber, landing face first into the stench of a decaying corpse. It wouldn't have taken a doctor to tell me that I had multiple broken ribs and a collapsed lung, as every breath I took vomited streams of blood. I coughed splattering blood everywhere. I was done for. It would only be another minute or so until my eventual death. I dropped my head in a shameful defeat, when suddenly the corpse kicked me with its bony feet. What the f- <sighs> I wheezed, as more blood spewed out of my mouth, lifting my head to take a look at the corpse. And its body began to regenerate. The more of my blood it sucked in like a vacuum. I can help you, the corpse mumbled, as its nearly ripped off jaw pulled itself back together. I groaned in pain as I felt the trembling of the ground beneath me as the demon stomped closer. Give me your arm, it pleaded, now in more precise words as it regained its ability to speak. With mere seconds left to decide, I didn't know what to do. I was as good as dead anyway, especially like this. It was worth a try, even if it gave me the slightest chance at saving Ellie. I had failed her as a father, but I would not fail her by letting her be subjugated to that fucking demon. I let loose a weak sigh and pushed my arm towards its mouth with all the energy I could muster. Its sharp fangs punctured my skin and, from what I could feel, injected some thick liquid into me. A strange tingle rushed around me before it began to sting more and more, as if I'd been exposed to the strongest venom that could possibly exist. I screamed in agony when, suddenly, I heard my ribs snap back into place. My wounds slowly regenerated, and now I had the energy to dodge the charge of the demon. I stood a few meters away from it, astonished at the feat I'd just achieved. My body had naturally moved out of the way in what a biologist would call a reflex action clenched my fist and could instantly feel raw power coursing through my veins. It came for me once more, but the speed of my actions was so fast, I'd unknowingly punched it in the face, causing it to lose balance. Whilst the beast was stunned, I grabbed the pickaxe and held it above my head, clenching it so tight my fingers had squashed the wooden handle like a sponge. With all my newfound strength, I went for the head. A thick, dark green liquid oozed out from its head when the spirits of the natives finally had their chance to escape. They jumped the demon with a flurry of attacks until it no longer twitched. The giant claws released their hold on the prisoners in the chamber before the bodies of their victims hit the cold damp floor. The chamber shifted and morphed back to what the normal caves in the mountain would have looked like. Everything vanished before my eyes except my daughter's body. I ran towards her and checked her once again before lifting her up. When I turned around to make my way out of the cave, the spirits of my ancestors stood behind me, together 
with happiness on their faces. One of them picked the silver-plated pickaxe off the ground before everything went dark. I'd done it. I'd saved Ellie and freed my ancestors from the tight noose of that creature. The Harrisons were finally free from this damn curse. My eyes adjusted to the pitch black, and for some strange reason I could see through the darkness. I made my way back from where I'd come. The flooding that once filled the entrance was now gone, and once I was back outside I noticed the fog had also ceased to exist as the rays of the morning sun rose from the horizon. I raced back to the car and tossed Ellie in the back seat before hitting the gas towards the nearest hospital I could think of. I glanced back at the old road that led to the dilapidated building, when I noticed the body of a man staring back at me with gleaming red eyes. He resembled the creature that had bitten me in the caves. I knew that would not be the last time I'd see him, but my main concern at that moment was to get Ellie the care she needed. So a pretty cool story there for your Monday evening entertainment. Hope you like that one. If you didn't, tell me why not in the comment section below the video. I'll do my best, as ever, although I regularly fail, to try and reply to as many comments as I can. So yeah, I like that one. Uh, worked as a standalone story, but it kind of left itself open at the end for um, a bit more to come. We'll see, we'll see. So yep, yeah, I am still in the Netherlands, the land of no mountains whatsoever, so that's not really a story that I can relate to anymore, but enjoying life here. If you have any questions about my life, what I'm doing, what I'm up to, how it's going, please feel free to ask me. I might do a Q&A soon. I haven't done one of those for many a year. Well, okay, see what you think. Back again tomorrow on my second channel, I'll be back again and here again on Wednesday. Until then, very, very sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>